Welcome to About That Bible with Every Nation NYC, helping you get more out of that Bible. Make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at About That Bible, and you can find us on all podcast platforms that you fancy. Today we are talking about the law and why Christians get to break it. Uh, my name is Ilsa, and this we have some guests. There are three of us. Hello, I'm Nathan. Hello, I'm Jeff. Jeff, good to have you with us. I'm glad to be here. We're going to talk about law because there's a big chunk of the Bible where we see all these laws and I'm not sure I do any of them. So why do Christians break laws? Starting off, where where do we find the laws in the Bible? What do we mean by law? Yeah, so the law can kind of refer to the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and most of the law or all of the law, all of the laws, excuse me, are found within the Torah. Um, How many are there? There's like 611, 600. Apparently there's a debate about that. You've counted them. No. Yes, personally, I went through this morning and counted them. I think rabbis (laughs) counted them. And then they had a debate about whether there was a 611 or 613. Let's just say over 600. That's safe. Though not 600. I don't think it's 600. uh, um, totally different ones. So some of them repeat themselves. Okay. Within that 600. And, um, which is part of the problem with that first bit. Mm. So the, the, <laughs> all of those, though, are found in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then there's a big repeat in Deuteronomy, right? So, yeah. There were some new ones to like spice it up a little bit. Okay. But Moses lots just of like repeat. threw those into his sermon. Like, right. like oh, didn't boom. see that coming. Yeah. So if he, you are reading the, you are reading the Bible in a year chronologically, this is the bit that sucks. Yeah, this is <laughs> this is the best part. Or <laughs> Jeff, is this your favorite? You just take your time and read, you know? And that's why Jeff's here, because he's gonna help us to understand why this bit's the best part. And if you checked, I'm like ten days behind our reading plan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there know. with you, Confessions. Jeff. Confessions. Confessions by pastors. I'm actually ten days ahead. So. Oh, oh. She should be leading this podcast. So I feel like this would be a good... Take a out. (laughs) (laughs) What do you think this is? She's testing us. Get get in line, Jeff. I feel like this would be a good point to... to, A good time to point out that we are um, pastors of Every Nation Church, um, NYC, but... um, these are our opinions. Like we're we're going to talk a little bit about our opinions here, and are not necessarily the express views of the church that we pastor. Yes, um, I love this, this so because this means it's going to get. We just want to give ourselves a little bit of of, of lead to um to Say have a conversation. Wrong. Well, to have a conversation. To have fun. Have fun. We're gonna have fun. <laughs> I never say that. That's always like saying up for. It's always saying up for a hard time. Like Elsa, you want to have fun on Friday? And she's like, no. <laughs> it's too much pressure. <laughs> Got it. On that note, what are the purpose of these laws that we find in the beginning of the Bible? We've read all the narrative, and then we've got to the really slow bit. <laughs> Why are they there? Well, I think essentially, the one of the primary reasons is God wanted to set apart. His people, uh, certain kinds of people uh, that other people would be attracted to. And so that the world would be kind of separated from the unrighteous and the righteous. And everyone will hopefully want to be joining the righteous side. (laughs) Join Team Righteous. That's right. (laughs) So for some context here, we have met Moses. Moses has got these people out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. He's brought them into the wilderness. And then we start getting like... Laws. Start getting the law download. First at Sinai, and then for two years as they wander the wilderness. It's a lot of laws, a little bit of narrative. A and then right as Mo is getting ready to peace out on top of a mountain, he preaches them all again and with some extra ones, it's right? In Deuteronomy. So ones. that's what that's what Deuteronomy is about. Hmm. Yeah. So they were trying to be a distinct people. And what are some ways that the laws help them to be righteous? So the law is, I think it's important to talk about as well, just the, it's not just distinctness for distinct, distinctness mm. sake, but God is continually calling them to holiness because he is holy. He's saying, be holy because I'm holy or be holy like I am holy. Mm. And holiness means otherness or distinctness. Um, holiness is like the sun. Uh, you can't go near it. It's something that's unapproachable, which then you start to think, well, God is asking us to be absolutely other, something insanely different. How does that work out? Um, 
and we'll we'll get to that. It, and the short of it is just that it doesn't work out terribly well. <laughs> it also reminds me of uh, the Abraham the covenant, right? Because mm. part of that covenant was he's going to bless Abraham, but his people are going to be a blessing to the the world. That's right. In order to do that, they would have to be set apart. They would also have to be holy as well. Mm -hmm. So the laws are almost like a fulfillment of that covenant to prepare them to be a blessing to the world. So God is building one on top of the other. Um, and each one is, it's not just coming out of nowhere. It's coming out of his heart. It's uh, be, ho be holy like I'm holy. It's coming out of the nature and the essence of God. Mm. Um, so he's not just making them up. Somebody once asked me, so is God subject to these laws or is God just making them up? Is God just saying, well, now you have to follow, you know, the no pig law. Mm. And um, and or you know no murder or don't lie, um, the, and the Ten Commandments are really a, a a good example of this. They're a disclosure of God. Uh, be holy like I'm holy. Don't lie because God is truth. You know, um, don't worship false idols because God is certainly not honoring or recognizing any uh, anything other than His deity or His holiness. Um, honor your father and mother because that is the nature and the essence of the Trinity. Uh, that's perfectly expressed in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah. That question assumes that everybody needs a law, but God doesn't. Like, uh, you only need law <laughs> if you need some form of, like, correction. Yes. Or, like, some sort of improvement. Right. Or you're trying to go somewhere. But God is perfect within himself. Absolutely. Yeah. And so he doesn't need an external um, law or fence, like, around him. If God wants to eat bacon, he can eat bacon. <laughs> he made it. <laughs> Yeah. But I've always wondered why they made pigs if you can't eat them. We'll get Man, to that. Man, we will get to that. <laughs> Hopefully we get to that. Stay tuned. So um, there are um, all sorts of holiness laws, food laws, dietary laws that do create a distinct people. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should talk so, about that for a little bit. Yeah, right? what are some examples of things that make them distinct? So dietary laws are, are a good example. That's true. Uh, um, so all of the... Um, all of the restrictions and all of the things that we enjoy, it does feel like God just outlawed the best foods. No, it does. When it writes mm. it, it does say like, most of the time it's like, you get to eat these ones. Mm, it does it, it like a little bit more positive. <laughs> and then when we talk about like kosher, like that's, they've like rewritten that, right? To be like, this is the list. But like when he writes it, he's like, you get to eat all these ones. You get to eat cows and sheep yeah. and goats, but not pigs. And not vultures. Not vultures. But who would want to eat I a like vulture? I like the vulture gets a name. Gets a name check. Or like a bald eagle or something. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, fair enough. There are some in there you read that and you're like, yeah, I don't yeah, want to eat Yeah, we that. don't want to eat the vulture. We want to eat the pig and the lobster and the shrimp. That's right. Too the right. best kinds. <laughs> That's literally my kid's favorite food. Mm -hmm. Like those three things. <laughs> and I think it's like a lot of people. Uh, yeah. So that's a distinctness, right? If you're not allowed to eat these certain foods, then that means that, and also you're not allowed to associate with people that do. Um, then as well, uh, their garments weren't allowed to have mixed um, mixed fabrics. Yes. Why so you, is that? So it's a, it's a picture of holiness as well. Mm. They just look, so their garments would look a certain way. Yeah. So you, it was either had to be cotton or wool. I assume those are the, the <laughs> they weren't dealing in polyester. I don't know. <laughs> Spandex. Maybe I'm not silk. an expert in ancient, <laughs> ancient fabric. <laughs> ancient textiles. <laughs> Jeff? Yes, Jeff. Well, I'm so glad you're here, Jeff. <laughs> it just so happens I'm wearing. Uh... <laughs> this is probably one that like most of us are breaking even right now. Yeah. We'll me. probably have like, a cotton polyester blend <laughs> on yeah, most probably. of the time. And so almost every day at any given moment, we are breaking the old covenant laws. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, I mean, even speaking about breaking laws, right? They were probably the only group of people that had uh, ceremonial laws that dictated how to mm. recover from breaking laws. Yeah. So morals, right? So they had to either sacrifice something for sin, which no one else in the world believed existed at the time. Wow. And uh, wow, there was a certain way they had to sacrifice animals, specific kinds of animals at that. Mm -hmm. So they were the only group of people that had that in existence. Wow. Then there was also the calendar. Um, they had a very, uh, they had a feasts. I think three feasts a year, and then also the the weekly Sabbath, where they stopped all Jewish people would stop all all work on Which Saturday. Really represents that, like this, like you're saying, it represents not a character of God, but like an an ideal of his of him mm -hmm. that we wouldn't just like work all the time. Yeah, and the year of jubilee as well. 
Yes, I love the year of Jubilee. Yeah. We should reenact that. I know. Every like, so the year we not of try Jubilee in is the millennium. <laughs> debts are canceled every 50 years. That's right, and your slaves will let go. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully that doesn't apply today. <laughs> <laughs> you get debts are canceled. You don't have to give back your fields. Yes. Mm. So, yeah. like, if you bought a house, you have to give it back. Because you've like made your money out of that field. I don't know if it would work today, but it's the idea is that it would would promote equity. It's a beautiful picture of like who owns the thing. God owns it. Mm -hmm. You make money Mm -hmm. out of it. You like get a field. You make crops. You like make lots of money out of that crop, and then you give it back. Yeah, it's also fairness. Yeah, because then someone else can go use that field next time. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> Stop hogging the field. <laughs> that's what God said. Stop hogging that field. That's, right. that's my field. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, also, they had to trim their hair particular ways or not. Like, I think there's a law about oh. do not trim the edges of your beard. Yeah. So, those are so, all noticeable I mean, that's gonna things. Create a very peculiar looking people. Yep. I mean, so yeah. you could see through the clothes, through their weekly habits, through their annual habits, through the way that they. Um, sowed and plowed their fields uh, or particularly harvested their fields, right? They weren't allowed to harvest all the way to the edges and they were only allowed to harvest once. Um, they were, God's people were peculiar people. Mm. They were very different. And it, and it talks a lot about strangers coming in. And mm-hmm. I suppose that's, as those strangers are coming in, they're seeing like, these are different people. Like these strangers, you're having to treat me in a very specific way. Mm. Like leave me some food and stuff. And I like what Jeff was saying, that this was supposed to um, highlight their relationship and standing with God and be an attractive quality to the mm. world. Um, it wasn't just to look weird for weird sake. It was to look to be different, be holy like God is holy, and so that um, the, the, there would be a blessing to the world. Yeah. So some of the hard... Well, maybe this is just my personal... I'm just going to bring my personal grievances <laughs> in. Some of the hardest laws to read are the criminal laws. Okay. What's going on there? Why, what are the purpose of why those? Do you, why do you find them hard? Give me, some, let, give us some examples here. Um, the only one I can think of is hilarious. But <laughs> Please do share. I love a good hilarious you law. You said fun, so here we go. Okay, here we go. Um, if two men are having a fight and a, one of their wives comes out and tries to stop the other one, uh, by grabbing their privates, they have to <laughs> chop her hand off. I believe it's in Deuteronomy somewhere. Um, I think we should bring that back. <laughs> um, yes. There's things like that. So the, they're difficult, I think, just because of our point of view. Yes. So I, I, I guess the, we would need to understand more of the cultural... So when you read a law like that, there's a, there's a ton of laws like that that actually exist. You can you can go look up like the the fifty most irrelevant laws, you know. And it's like if the if an elephant sitting on the court, stairhouse course and your court is, court stair, stairs, then you're not allowed to move it or something like you know. The, yeah. Every city or jurisdiction has sort of laws almost exactly like that. And you gotta you gotta laugh because that came from somewhere. It's true. <laughs> like that happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's That's basically true. what uh, what I'm saying. Like yeah. that 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 must have happened. Maybe it happened twice. What's Maybe it became a way that women were settling arguments. So they just come out and be like, <laughs> they're like, we we got to make a, a law. Very about that. effective way to stop the fight. <laughs> but if you even think about it, it's, it's interesting that um, a developing nation mm-hmm. needed to have some type of civic law, civil law. Yeah. Yeah. And. These are very specific laws. <laughs> that one is specific. <laughs> a lot you, of them they are. They definitely <laughs> happened. You know they had to write it down. That because was not happened. dreamt up. Yeah. yeah. And so it's it's not like the Israelites were the ones coming up with these laws. Yeah. So what's amazing about this is it's almost as if God knew or even saw some of the issues that are occurring earlier and so put down specific laws that the Israelites were struggling with. Mm-hmm. To try and help them to be a better people yes because at the same time as i was getting these laws in these books you also see these same people rebelling Mm. and grumbling and having a problem and not really following (laughs) the laws right yeah no yeah (laughs) so you can see why they're there (laughs) though unfortunately there's no story to explain that one (laughs) i yeah that would be a lot of fun um so there there are um they were in a, a political and social context 
Um, you have Mount Sinai right as the, the first generation comes out of Egypt. And so you're dealing with a, a generation of slaves um, or freed slaves. Uh, and then there's 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and you get Deuteronomy. There's development um, through Leviticus. It's kind of kind of timeless, but there's some chunks that do connect it to some, some, some narrative as well. Mm. Um, and then, um, and then you have the law restated for a nation that was basically a, an establishing nation, I guess. How would you put that? Like, a, it was a brand new generation. Yeah. It was a wilderness generation. <laughs> yeah. The one the in Deuteronomy is like mm -hmm. second generation audience, but they're still growing. Yeah. Significantly. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense that they're like trying to establish fairness. They're trying to establish law, like rules so that you're not just killing anyone and getting away with it. Yeah. And there are a lot of um, rules about adultery, which can be like hard mm -hmm. to read. Um, but it also makes sense if you are a small knit society trying to get on with each other. If somebody mm. cheats on their wife or cheats on their husband, like that's going to be a big deal because mm -hmm. everybody's related to each other. It's a big deal. So you can see why, even though it's hard for us to be like, this is not like a criminal law thing for us. But in a very developing small, you're a developing society and you're a small, very close knit society. It does have some broad reaching That's impacts. Good. Yeah, it's going to cause problems mm -hmm. when everyone's related to each other. I can only imagine. And only you're nice. in the wilderness and there's no TV and there's, there's, <laughs> there's not a lot, to, a lot else to talk about. <laughs> you're just moving oxen about by the same thing. Um, yeah, so... Why do we not follow any of these laws? Or why do when we read them? We're reading them. We're like, nope, nope. Don't murder people. Still got that one. What's yeah, going on? There's a, lot, there's a lot of things that feel irrelevant to us as Christians. And I think that that's what we need to, to, to figure out here today is like, what do we do with this as, as Christians? Yeah. Why do, we, why do we break them? Why do we break them? Some of them. Why do we read one? them at all? Can we just skip that bit? You know, sometimes Can we just tear, like we tear just, it out of our Bible? We choose and pick the ones we like. Right? And yeah. let's be honest, most of us do sort of not choose to read those bits. <laughs> Very often. <laughs> unless love... you're properly conscientious. <laughs> and I love that we're taking the time as a, as a community to read through them right now. Yeah. And I think that we're richer for them and we're going to talk about, about well, why. Well, I think yeah. we can talk about, if we talk about why we break them and what's going on there, mm -hmm. that will help us to have a newfound appreciation or a greater understand. Mm -hmm. So what's going on? So in short, they're fulfilled in Jesus. But we need yeah. to talk about what that means. <laughs> what does it mean to and, be fulfilled in Jesus? And how. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. So I'll take a stab at this. Sure. And then um, Jeff will correct you. And then Jeff, and then Jeff can no, stab me. Elsa will correct both of us. <laughs> All right. So, I like Jesus. So. Let's, like, let's zoom out and consider like the whole thrust of the Bible that God designed us for a relationship with him, to walk with him, to know him, to enjoy him. Um, and we break that very quickly. God is then building a people to know him and walk with him and be an example to the world, calling people back into relationship with him. Um, what I see the laws are, it, 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 so God calls the Israelites to himself at Sinai. Mm -hmm. And it all goes super wrong really quick. So this is right when God is establishing the laws. We get the laws right after the story of Sinai and Exodus. The laws start just rolling out, right? Um, and God says, "I want to make you a kingdom, a kingdom of priests." Basically, saying, "We're gonna, we're gonna abide together, and you're gonna sh be the inter intermediates between me and the rest of the world." We're gonna be like Eden again. Yeah, He's bringing them back into Eden to walk with them, to know them, for them to hear His voice and, and obey His words. And Moses is doing that really well right um but the people of god immediately build a calf and ruin ruin that relationship like every the, the tone changes so much from that point on and you never really get it back um and um and so what i see the laws are is if you stripped away the relational portion of our of so elsa and i are married if we just gave a list of the do's and the don'ts of our marriage or your marriage, Jeff, with, er with Erica, um, it would sound really awful. Like you have to be available 24 seven by phone. You're not allowed to eat or drink or talk on the phone with people of the other gender for terribly long. 
Um, you always have to know where the other one is. <laughs> I always have to know where you are. You always have to sleep in this bed. If you're not going to be asleep in this bed by, you know, our bedtime, then you need to uh, book that a week in advance. <laughs> you always have to put the milk back in the fridge. You know, and if you don't, then... <laughs> the list is petty. I mean, <laughs> it's petty, it's long, it's arduous, it's stupid, it's uh, like just... It, it's And it sounds rotten. If you wrote it down, it would it, sound like... Dude, you if you wrote either. down all the implicit and explicit rules of a marriage, it would just sound so bad. You have to be emotionally available 24 seven, physically available, you know, um, and it, it would just, it would just be bad. And so I think what the law is, is essentially a, 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 a relationship divorced of the relationship. <laughs> oh, like they chose not to prioritize and not to have the relationship. And so it just got reduced to, Okay. If we're not going to be close together, because he has mm. a relationship with Moses where like they talk all the time. Yeah. They're like, know each other's heart. It's all great. He can't have that with the people. So he has to like state it. So it's like, all right, so here's the rules of engagement. Here's the boundaries. If we're not going to be talking together, if we're not going to be relating to each other and enjoying each other's presence and company. I'm going to have to write it down. This is how it's going to have to go down. Uh, and so to me, that's, that's what the law, that's a way that we could view the law. Uh, and then in Jesus, he walks that narrow path. He does it um, with with God. He does it, but not from not from just trying to obey the law and fulfill it, or um, but from a heart of a son, like God, I love you, and so of course I want to obey your laws because I because I deeply desire to be with you. Um, and then, um, as as a church, we are filled with the Spirit of God and have the same heart. Is Jesus, and we're going to talk. We we can go into uh, Galatians that talks a lot about that. How we're filled with the Spirit, that we're not slaves, but we're sons. We're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And I think that that's what he's contrasting is basically a relationship, divorce of the relationship, or the relationship of love and affection that we now share with with God. So with Jesus, we get the relationship, so we no longer have to have the list of laws. Yes, but but <laughs> there's gotta be a it's, but. Come it's, on, it's Jeff. a little bit. Str I think I would say stronger disagree than that. With but Jeff, him, Jeff, come on in. <laughs> Do we answer that question specifically? I just disagree no. with him. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. Nathan and I talked a little bit about this before, uh, and uh, I feel like we sort of landed on two different camps. I like that though. <laughs> I'm all for two different camps because the nice thing is you're in two different camps and the same church, and it's nice to remind the world that that is possible. That's so, true. Yeah. That's true. So if uh, if if I remember correctly, Nathan, yes, uh, Tuesday's or Monday's mor morning session was you landed with all the laws being abolished. Well, I'm <laughs> I'm open to that idea. <laughs> uh, well, not not abolished because Jesus said right, not I'm not. But in, in Matthew five, he says I've come to fulfill the law, not abolish correct. the law. And then he goes on to say it even stronger. And so, like, as I read Matthew 5, it's tough to, to get my head around that and then square it with later writings of Paul in, like, Galatians. But, okay, let's let Jeff make his No, no, so, yeah, thing. so you, you meant, I meant uh, we are no longer bound by the laws, mm. the Old Testament laws. Uh, yeah. Whereas I sort of landed, because we were talking about the moral law specifically, Ten Commandments, right? Yeah. Uh, Did and, those still apply to us? Right, and it's it seems as though it should. We talk so about them in church. Yeah, and we those we, are the one bit. We live by them too. They are technically laws that we live by as Christians. We will not break them because we know we should not, or we should not. Break them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but we also know we recognize that because there's a consequence to that. Yeah, no, uh, it, it is easy to see those. Yeah, so usually I feel like we equate law, um, predominantly because there's going to be a significant consequence to breaking it. As opposed to a, a should or a, a, an option means there is a consequence, but it may not be as severe. So we like understand that there's a consequence <laughs> with the Ten Commandments, but yeah. with the like. Right. And so. Oaks and ones. Eh. There are two that are written very differently, right? Uh, all of them are written kind of in a negative way. It's like, do not do this, do not do this. But then there are two that simply just mm. say, keep the Sabbath and honor your mother and father or your, honor your parents. Yes. Right? Without the negatives. And. In those moments, when we compare, it's like, okay, I get it. I won't kill somebody. Mm. But as a pastor, I might be busy, and therefore, I might not take a <laughs> Jennifer, Sabbath. Do you not honor, <laughs> do you not honor the Sabbath and keep it holy? <laughs> so then, 
if I were to kill somebody or if I were to cheat on Erica, and I would never do that, Erica. <laughs> but if hypothetically that happened, I would be I would I would hope that I would volunteer to step down or the church would strip me of my role. Mm. But if I break the Sabbath or don't keep a Sabbath, uh, which I would just confess I am guilty of sometimes, I still have a job. <laughs> yeah. So we're okay with serial workaholics, but not okay with serial adulterers. Right. And so... And those, that's the Ten Commandment. Yeah. They're both Ten And there's, there's an, an example early on in Exodus, I think, where somebody's caught picking up some sticks. That's right. He gets stoned. They stoned Wait, that. Wait, picking sticks? Yeah. yeah. Oh, my. We need, the we need fire. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's picking a stick on this Sabbath to clarify. Yeah. Sorry. Not yeah. just like on a Friday. <laughs> I thought there was something wrong with sticks there. No, it was on the Sabbath. On I the see. Sabbath. That's right. Um, so there's definitely an emphasis change, if nothing else, um, between Old Covenant um, laws and the way that those were followed and the way that we follow these laws today as Christians, as believers. Um, Jesus came to fulfill those laws. He walked that perfect life. Um, and I would say that all of the laws or an argument that I that I really am compa- I'm kind of compelled by this. All of the laws and the relationship um, was pointing to Jesus. They were they were there to highlight this Messiah, and that when he came, he checked the boxes. They don't pass away. They don't go away, but they're there. They stand as a testament to his work, and um, and then they don't apply directly to his followers. Wait a minute. So if that is the case, so we can be like, okay, great. We don't have this. Why do we still hold the Ten Commandments as like, apart from those ones? Because we do talk about those. We, you, In most churches, you will hear like they'll do a sermon on mm-hmm. them and they don't say, well, Jesus fulfilled them, but you might want to think about doing these ones. So all of the Ten Commandments are then are, are repeated in Jesus. Uh, in Jesus' teachings, and then throughout the rest of the New Testament. So it's not like, because they're a revelation of the heart and character of God, they're not, um, they, they're, re- they're repeated independent of the old, uh, excuse me, of the Ten Commandments. And so we can follow those and not these. And not the ones about but, oxen. But, but the, the net result is basically following the Ten Commandments, except for how uh, the, the law and Sabbath is expressed yeah because the church is not excommunicating anybody for breaking sabbath so how is it different Jeff? well the other thing is that jesus um lived the laws perfectly so a part of that means he was correcting maybe any misconceptions that the israelites had as well um about the law so when that guy was stoned for the sabbath he was making a point that there was a a, a story where a, a, a lame person came to jesus and was healed on the sabbath and jesus mm-hmm. told him to go to the temple and the Pharisees were upset because he went to the temple on the Sabbath. He was carrying his mat, actually, mm. that he had been sleeping on. And they were angry at him. But Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees, saying, he's been healed. What's wrong with him praising the Lord on the Sabbath? Right? Yes. So he was actually correcting, not just uh, um, fulfilling and living it out. He was actually living it to it perfectly. Um, and I feel like that points to that relational a- aspect that you were talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, R.C. Sprawl actually had a great example of this. He was telling a story of uh, how he went to this church to preach, and they invited him back to their house. I guess it's an Asian family because when they went to their house, he found about 15 people praying to uh, their dead ancestors or dead relatives. And these are Christians. Oh. So uh, Sprawl was like, hey, you do know that that's... uh, not permissible. Not cool. <laughs> no. As Christians. And their response was, oh, that's that's the Old Testament. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and so he said, yeah, that's true. It's the Old Testament. But what about being in a new covenant has changed what God delights in? Hmm. So what was once uh, punishable by death, worship to idols, mm-hmm. suddenly even switched where God is like, oh, that's cool. I like that. Mm-hmm. Nothing. Right. And so not, even though yeah. it's not punishable, um, it still presents what actually God delights in and wants his people to also delight in as well. And so if we're people of the Spirit and our nature has been changed, which is what, what the whole New Testament is attesting to, 
that we're a new creation and uh, that we no longer walk by the flesh, by our fleshly desires, but by the spirit. And our spirit cries, Abba, Father, we want to please you. That's actually a great, a great example. Um, so Jeff, would you, would you say that the, the 10 commandments in themselves still, um, and I, and I'm like, I, I'm, I'm really trying to figure this out right now <laughs> that they still apply to new Testament Christians. Uh, in my opinion, I would say yes. Okay. They still apply. But... And then how would you separate them from, um, other other laws like the ones that we the ones we've talked about mixed fabrics food laws dietary right. laws so when we left off in that conversation mm. i landed by saying that we should fire all pastors that don't think it's sabbath <laughs> <laughs> yeah you did say that the other wow, day we yeah. did get controversial we, we, we did I, say that on tuesday i should add that, that jeff that has also already admitted that he sometimes doesn't take so a if anyone else is listening to this i could use a job after this podcast <laughs> apparently not as a pastor literally fired yourself <laughs> So, so how would we, how do we, um, yeah, how do we, how do you break the Ten Commandments out of the rest of the laws, and then how is the, then maybe we can talk about the, how the Sabbath is a little bit different. Yeah, I think by categorizing some of the laws, which you know Augustine and uh, Calvin did into moral, civil, and uh, ceremonial laws, mm. you get three different kinds. So, just simply by compartmentalizing you can separate the ceremonial because you no longer need to do that because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. So ceremonial was everything around sin offerings and, and all of the temple activity. Right. Which is weird. I mean, the temple doesn't even exist anymore. That's so right. like, it's not even like the Jewish people can do. That's also true. <laughs> so that is very clearly de- fulfilled in Jesus. And he prophesied the end of the temple. Right. Which happened 70 years. No, excuse me, 40 years. Yep. 40 years. Uh, which is a very biblical number. Um, after after the the death and resurrection of Jesus. Yep. So those ones were good. We're totally good. obviously fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Right. Okay. And even in the New Testament, there are a new set of civic laws because they're living with another nation. The civic laws are really based just for mm-hmm. themselves as they were a nation of themselves in order to live. And so as they're sort of assimilated into another culture, they're living under the rules of another set of people. So those are like Roman laws, yeah. In the in in when the New Testament is being formed, right? Just like today, we have a set of laws in the United States of America, even in New York and themselves, mm-hmm. that we must follow. So as they were coming out of out of Egypt, they were developing civic laws for themselves that were distinctly Jewish because they were establishing their own na- nation, their own nation. And national yes. identity. Yeah, and they also need something to help them rule themselves. Yes, at the time. Yeah. So you'd separate civic ceremonial and then the third category we're left with moral and those persist i well reading further in the new testament specifically Mm -hmm. in galatians uh i am open to be swayed that's great (laughs) we are both open to taking the other person's does that basically mean that there's no more controversy i said well so i think like when you read matthew 5 it really sounds like so jesus jesus says um, uh, and I hope I'm going to try to get this right. Um, he says, I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it and not one jot or tittle or mark of the law mm-hmm. will, will decrease. And anyone who, and this is like where I feel the weight of God, anyone who tries to turn down the severity of these laws will be judged. And now mm. I'm like, that's what like makes me go, well, actually I want Jeff's position of like the laws persist. Um, uh, and 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 then he says something else. Oh goodness, I'm going to need to look it up. Uh, but then in Galatians, Paul says there um, is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Don't submit yourself to a yoke of slavery. Don't go back to those laws. Um, and he, were, he he accounts everything that happened at Mount Sinai to slavery. He yeah, calls like he equates law. Mount Sinai to slavery. And and the Ten Commandments are what was said at Mount Sinai. And so, the um, theologically, how we arrive at essentially, Jeff and I would both follow the Ten Commandments. We both would live them out in our lives. Um, but there's two ways that you can arrive at that. One is by saying the Ten Commandments don't no longer apply directly to Christians. Only what is stated 
directly in the New Testament. And you get nine out of the ten commandments. Sabbath is a little bit fuzzy. Um, Hebrews says that it's essentially fulfilled in Jesus, that Jesus is our Sabbath rest. Um, the other way is that they persist, except for what the New Testament explicitly says does not persist, which is Sabbath. It says that Jesus is our Sabbath rest. So either way, <laughs> you end up with the same nine out of the ten moral laws. Are there no other moral laws I say the Ten Commandments? Uh, that's, that's tough. That's a good question. Yeah. I think there are probably some <laughs> that we don't do. We, right. We'll, so the, uh, like cutting a woman's hand off when she like, goes for <laughs> that so that's, that's, that's a that, criminal. That, that's criminal. That's a civil law. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there, there's some stuff that's just kind of, um, so there are some other things that, that do persist. Um, uh, in, um, Acts chapter 15. Do you want to talk about Acts 15? The Jerusalem council? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean. It's, it's mainly about circumcision. <laughs> it is. So everything comes to a point, <laughs> and it all it all hinges on circumcision. Uh, do you have to become Jewish in order to become Christian? And Because they start having this problem. Yes. Where, like, this was a Jewish movement, Jesus movement, but now there are non-Jews joining the movement, and they're like, oh, this is a problem. Yeah. What are we going to do about all this distinctiveness? Do they have to join it? And what do they decide? Well, I mean, first they they were they required that salvation would only come if they were circumcised. That's yeah. what Peter and some other guys <laughs> were arguing. Yeah. Yeah. And so then Paul and Barnabas came and they presented a different argument, and so they settled saying that it is not required, but there were some other things that they should abstain from for the sake of the entire community, which included eating meat that was offered to idols, or meat that was strangled, or still had blood in it. Yep. And sexual immorality. Yes. Were the four things that they listed. You still got to obey this. Yeah. Um, and then they sent this letter and it says, and the brothers rejoiced. <laughs> yeah. Well, it just listed it exactly. farewell. <laughs> I, I thought it said the brothers rejoiced greatly. Get to end, yeah. <laughs> but the letter was very abrupt. It's just like farewell. <laughs> no circumcision don't, don't necessary. Do this. necessary. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so there are some other things. Christians are not allowed to drink blood, um, though that's not a more uh, moral. It would probably be, I don't know where that would fall exactly, but it's clear that, through the old of, covenants that part it's... part of that problem, right, is that yeah. it's very difficult to be like... Yeah. Well, it could, be, it could be argued as Noah. It's before, the, it's before Mount Sinai. Oh, um, Moa, then... Noah is told not to drink blood. So, so that goes way back. circumcision is before Mount Sinai. Yes, yeah. it is. That's true. But, but no, uh, excuse me, Abraham is declared righteous before he circumcised. And that's like one of Paul's major arguments in Galatians. Interesting. And then there's another one, uh, tithing. Is tithing a New Testament requirement? Oh, that's the controversial one. Mm. It, it can be a controversial one. I'm, I'm pretty settled that it is a New Testament floor to Christian generosity. It's not, the, it's not, our, it's not our goal, but it's like where, where we start as New Testament Christians because tithing is introduced with Abraham and Melchizedek. But I think it comes back to what Jeff was talking about, <laughs> where he you were talking about the people praying to their ancestors. Um, just because we don't have to follow the Old Testament laws anymore, mm. they were based on some ideals and some principles yeah. that are from the heart of God, like we're saying, yes. he is holy. And so it's like there are things that we should still do, but it's much more, it's less like black and white. You're not going to get stoned for it. It's not that. But the heart of God is still the same. Yes. And so our heart should be turned towards him. And so that's where we can say he's, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Mm -hmm. Even though the way in which we interact and relate to him has been, has been growing and developing. Yeah. So if we're allowed to break these laws, are we agreed? <laughs> We're, well, we don't which, have to do which, which laws? <laughs> some of the laws. So I, I, do, I do appreciate the distinctiveness that some of these are displaying like... Yeah, I mean, we... God's heart for us. It, so if you don't take it as uh, the Old Testament moral laws persisting, then technically that statement is correct. We are allowed to break the laws, right? Paul also writes that all things are permissible but not beneficial. Mm. So technically you're allowed to, but there will be consequences if you break it. There's always it. still a consequence. Right, yes. <laughs> and it could be evidence that, that your heart is not turned towards God. Yeah. Yep. That's a big one. Like like back to the beginning why they had laws. 
Yeah, so if if the Spirit of God is in you, and if you are now a son that cries out, Abba, Father, then there should be a change of desire, a change of heart direction. And that's that's, that's such so much of the thrust of Christianity. It's not about perfection, but direction. And this is also why Paul calls the law um, death. It's like it's going to bring you death. Yeah. Um, and I think of if our relationship, if you wrote up all of the list of rules and said, here's how we're going to relate. I think that it could bring, (laughs) it could bring death to a relationship. Oh my, yeah, it would be terrible. It would would be the same for any, any friendship. Hey, you've got to call me every week. You've got to, you know, buy my meal half the time. Yeah. Like that's a friendship thing. That's not a law thing. It kills the friendship. Yeah. The magic. (laughs) The magic's gone. And, And so, and it, and it brings death to, to us because also ultimately we cannot fulfill the law and we fall short. And That's Paul right. says that it opens up uh, all sorts of sin. It, ge- it gives light. Um, it's like a mirror. It, sh- it demonstrates, it shows that we're exceedingly sinful in need of somebody to come along and fulfill these laws for us. Yeah. yeah. So if we can break these laws <laughs> or not do them and we are reading the Bible, they're, they're still in the Bible. They even are. though they're of a very specific time and place. Um, what do we learn about God in that? Because why are we reading it? Like, why do we still <laughs> read them? Like, we've just agreed we're beyond that. Jesus fulfills it. But um, what are what is a law that you are like or you are one of your favorite ones? Because it, what does it tell us about God? I suppose it's my thing. Like, we still read them. So what are we getting out of the? <laughs> <laughs> What's our favorite law? Yeah, there, each and, law is gonna so like tell us something. I like, I like this. So like, why why do we read the why do we read these still? Yeah. So I, I feel like we just like every, everything we read in the Word, it's uh there's always something to learn from. Um, even the sheer fact, this might be slightly heretical. As I'm <laughs> as we're having this conversation, I'm having this thought, and that the uh, the laws are quite condemning. It brings about this mm. sense mm. of condemnation on the no, people. Man. Paul, Paul agrees with you. Yeah, but and then we have to think about if the people are going to feel condemned, why would God subject them uh, to that kind of thing so early on in their life, right? And so mm. to address that in my mind, why it's important to read, I feel like uh, we begin to see that the people had to be shaped mm. in history first. They had to see that uh, we couldn't be bound by kind of our own human understanding of laws in itself. So there has to be history that shows and proves that. And w- woven through all that, there's always some kind of promise of a Savior, mm-hmm. of a Messiah that's going to release them from this law. And so reading the entire Bible in its entirety from Old Testament to New Testament like we're doing just is a clear picture of this path that's being paved yes. brick by brick to Jesus. Yeah. Oh, man. Dude, I really love that. <laughs> That's a great answer. I was thinking I like the other day, like, um, you know, in, my, in one of my connect groups, somebody asked, so is God learning how to be God here? And I was thinking, no, we're learning how to be his children. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Who, who <laughs> is it that develops? Yeah. Who is it that has 80, 90 years on earth? Who is it that starts as a baby and then dies as an old, old person, you know, and all through life changes their mind? who was a college student and was a, you know, communist and then was a, <laughs> then became an investment banker, you know, yeah. in their thirties. That's us. That's, that's the role that we play. Mm-hmm. It's not God. It's, it's us who develops and changes. And so God needed to show us the rules don't work. You've got to have a heart change. Right. And then we get to experience Jesus Christ. And yeah. so there's all of these thousands of years of R and D that God has downloaded to us through research and development, through his scripture, through his word. And when we read it, we get to appreciate all of that. Yeah. And to be fair, Deuteronomy is full of Moses being like, remember where you came from. Mm -hmm. Remember that you were slaves. Mm -hmm. And then this happened, and then this happened. Yeah, and he also, this is a really uh, big one, Deuteronomy 10, where he says, circumcise your hearts. Where he's just reminding them to stop being callous towards God. He wants a relationship, not just a blind obedience Mm -hmm. so even amongst in all those laws like god was still being like yeah i'm really just after your heart (laughs) but you're making me do this here we go yeah so jeff what's your favorite law what's your favorite one (sighs) favorite law i think i picked the craziest one right don't boil a 
a young goat or baby goat and it's going to make you... milk. <laughs> I was going to make you tell me like how that has the like heart of God, but like, I've got nothing. I think it, is it, that just mean? I think I... it's God. God being like, listen, you can do some disgusting, twisted things. Don't do them. And and don't. Yeah, yeah. that's not me. So I think so. I looked this up the other day. Mm. Uh, there's two camps. One pe- people think that it's inhumane to uh, boil the thing that gives life yeah. to the child. It's maybe just going against right. the life death. Thing. <laughs> but then if you think about the sacrifice and what you're sacrificing, it's like kind of counterintuitive. You're going to kill the animal anyway if it's a baby lamb or you know, firstborn or first fruit, whatever. Well, maybe that's just rubbing it in. <laughs> <laughs> so another scholar actually kind of posited that in that culture, there was actually a ritualistic practice mm. among Gentiles. Like they've done it before. Yeah. They've always done it before. And it's like you do it because uh, when you sacrifice it, it's a guaranteed fertile season of your land because you offer it to another yeah. god. Mm. And I'm more prone to that one. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Wow. It was another way that they were like yeah. picking another Acting god. Acting up. Yeah, that's right. So the heart of God in that is like, <laughs> sure. I am your only God. <laughs> yeah. Stop also, relying on other things. That's right. Wow. Also, just don't do that. It's terrible. Yes. Yeah, just mean. <laughs> just mean. <laughs> Though it does make me start to wonder, what does it taste like? Mm. <laughs> I boiled a chicken in milk. It was great. Somebody oh. did actually write. A scholar said that Jew- Jewish folks are in- lactose intolerant. Really? <laughs> it, well, <laughs> let us know in the comment section. <laughs> I think that might be. Mm, okay, that's that's interesting. Okay. Go to a land filled with Jeff's milk like, I'm not and owning honey. this thought. This is another scholar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or maybe they boiled it too much and the milk curdled. Who knows? They just didn't know how to cook milk properly. Or it wasn't way to sacrifice the eggs. <laughs> Elsa, do you have a favorite law? I feel like I've already shared pain. Oh. Oh, I like I like all the ones about like leave some for the foreigner and the stranger and the widow, widow and the orphan. Those are beautiful. Yeah. yeah like, don't gle- nice. don't harvest your field to the, all the way to the edges. Right. Yeah. There's lots of ones like that, and like refuge cities for the stranger, mm. for the person who's murdered someone by mistake. I like that it shows the heart of God is like a God of justice and it, who provides for people. Yeah. I like those ones. That one's great too because it's uh, he's preserving the world too, the yeah. earth. Yeah. It's like don't over harvest everything leave yes. some for the earth they're supposed to, you're supposed to give your fields a break yeah and stuff. yeah yeah i like those ones nathan have you got a favorite uh, uh, jeff stole mine man oh. <laughs> I, I like i like that one a lot because it's just so so it, f- it feels so bonkers um but it's actually about like a really good thing mm-hmm. could be or maybe not or lactose intolerance or like- <laughs> <laughs> i am fascinated by tithing um the, the, the fact that it just it seems to be more of a law of nature than a law of of God. Um, that it was that it was introduced at Melchizedek, excuse me, Melchizedek and then more formalized and ratified through the through the Levitical laws. Hmm. Um, but just that it comes out of nowhere. Because Melchizedek comes out of nowhere. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so I find that one really so you help us out. Where is Melchizedek? Melchizedek in the Bible? is um, is in Abraham. He's in the Abraham story. Abraham has just gotten some of his first downloads from God. Um, there's uh, some kings in in the land. He and Lot have just separated, and they steal Lot and all of his stuff. And Abraham rushes in with like a small band of warriors and takes on five kings, wipes them all out. Yeah, takes all this plunder, <laughs> and out of the woods walks Melchizedek. And he serves Abraham bread and wine, and Abraham gives him a tenth of the spoils. And so that's where we get. And then the tenth comes up again in Leviticus. Mm-hmm. And then in Hebrews, it says that Jesus is a priest by the order not of the Levites but of Melchizedek, because um, Melchizedek was a both a was a, both a priest and a king. He was the king of Salem, which would, would later become Jerusalem. Hmm. And so it's also a, a, the king of, of of peace. Salem is peace. And, um, and he's also a priest. Yeah. A high priest. A high priest. And you're like, where is where is this? And then <laughs> and it never um, who is this guy? And then he, <laughs> the, the, the author of Hebrews oh, look, says that Jesus is it. a priest by the order of Melchizedek by evidence of his um, indestructible life. So just like Melchizedek came from nowhere and went nowhere, we've never mentioned him again, 
Jesus um, uh, and, and is therefore considered eternal, Jesus is also eternal and therefore of the order of Melchizedek. And so that, that to me is just a fascinating law that is picked up from Melchizedek into the Levitical law and then uh, brought into New Testament Christianity. All the way through? All the way through. <laughs> so why do Christians get to break the law? Nathan? Okay. So we've covered like there's, the, there's two camps, basically. One is that the moral law continues to persist because it's the heart of God, um, including the Ten Commandments into New Covenant Christian living. The other is that the old law is completely um, abrogated or fulfilled in Jesus and no longer has direct application to us, but we still keep most of the Ten Commandments because they are repeated in the New Testament. And those are our two camps or ideas that exist and we're not exactly sure where we fall. Jeff, do you? <laughs> yeah, I would think I'm, after this conversation and some research, I'd probably f switch camps. Oh, I, I would think know. that uh, based on what we've read in Galatians, also what Paul says mm. uh, about all the law can be summarized into love each other as you would love yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have to say the Old Testament laws, including the Ten Commandments, are okay to be broken. But, but except that they're repeated in the New Testament. Yes. And they're repeated in the New Testament. Uh, it's just that we're not bound mm. by them as a law would bound us. So the reason that we don't lie is not because the Ten Commandments say don't lie. It's also because uh, we always have to think what would delight God mm. and what would please God as his children. And it's okay. about relationship. Yes. It's about the That's heart. funny because I read Galatians and talk, we spoke earlier and it was Galatians that was making me have that. Oh, you were changing to Jeff. Th that well, well uh, that that viewpoint that Jeff Jeff just expressed. But then you read G Jesus in Matthew chapter five. He says, "I've not come to fulfill the law or abolish the law, but fulfill it." And then he's like, "If you dare turn down the severity of it, even a little bit." And yeah. that's not that's not at all what we're trying to do here. That's not our heart. But that just like makes me go. <clears throat> I can't have that. <laughs> That's and so it thing, just kind though, of depends. It? Is it Galatians that you've read more recently in Acts 15? Or is it Jesus in Matthew chapter 5? And um, <laughs> they, they do harmonize, they do synchronize. But, um, and, and the outcome and how Christian behavior and Christian ethic um, is, I don't think that changes too much, depending on your viewpoint. No, because the emphasis is still there. Mm -hmm. And the point is not to take one over the other or make one less than the other. The point is, is that how we live has to still reflect God. Yes. yes. And on that note, that was about that Bible with Every Nation NYC. Make sure that you follow us on Instagram and Twitter at About That Bible. Also, if you want to read the Bible chronologically, you can find a um, chronological Bible plan in our show notes and you can read along and you too can power your way through the law books in the Bible. We'll see you later, guys. Bye. <laughs>